Hey everyone, welcome to week 60, day four. This is Thursday. This is our fourth day of our ongoing It's a Mess week. We've painted my mother on Monday. We've painted an empty glass jar for uh, Spanish Tuesdays, Martes de Español. We painted yesterday a pretty grungy cardboard box. And today, well, we'll see what we're going to do today. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day four. This is our fourth day on our ongoing... Uh, it's a mess week. <laughs> like I said, this week is a bit cathartic for me. I'm trying to come to terms with the painter that I know I am, but for some reason we are put in situations that sometimes we see ourselves under a new light or we start comparing ourselves a little bit too much and we realize, wow, I'm pretty different from other people. <laughs> I paint pretty differently from other people, which is a totally fine thing and I guess I know that about myself I think that's something that's super clear about myself but I've been thinking about this for the past couple of days and I realized well this is a very strange moment this moment feels like no other moment that I've experienced in my life so it is expected I would say because socializing a painting in a workshop, during a workshop with other people that are working in tandem with you we're all working together is very different from just putting a painting up in social media, just posting something in social media. The exchange, even though both of them are of a virtual nature, is quite, quite different. So my response is different. And I'm gonna say this is unfortunate. The only way I've been able to socialize my work for the last year and a couple of months has been virtually and has been through social media. And even though this project has given us wonderful things and a beautiful chance to create, to begin to take care of a small community that is born from the willingness to learn through painting, to learn about painting, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to learn about ourselves through painting. So understanding how our work would adapt to social media or to this kind of social media exercise was very, very exciting, but it also means that when you put all your eggs in that basket and you couple it with a pandemic and with social distancing, it means that there's no way to socialize your painting physically. There's no way to hang your painting in a physical space and there's no way to have an opening and there's no way to talk to people and to see their reactions, to hear what they are saying about your paintings, to see how the idea of the painting that had formed in their head compares to the one that is hanging on the wall. That always feels fascinating to me. One of the coolest things that we've noticed with this project is that when people purchase a painting and we FedEx it to them, and they finally get it and they write us back like, wow, I never expected this to feel like this. It is super, super exciting. I mean, we both hope that people's expectations are realized when they see the original painting. But the reality is that there's this very abstract space where these virtual images live and that data is being consumed by this rule set that has been created by the social media. So it's very different. And... I was glad that I could take myself away from that space to experience my painting or to experience the socializing aspect of my painting quite a bit differently while I was doing the workshops. Now, a different sort of transition happened with today's painting, and I thought it was really nice. And as soon as it happened and as soon as I was having this exchange, I was like, I have to paint this. So I think I've talked about George Pratt here before. George Pratt to me is just somebody who I admire profoundly. He's an illustrator, he's a comic book artist, he's a painter, he's a teacher, just an integral, well-rounded artist. And like I said, I admire him profoundly because I became aware of his work at a point in my life where I had a very different idea of comic books. So when I saw this graphic novel that he did, Enemy Ace War Idol, I was blown away. I was blown away by the story, but I was just shocked that that sort of storytelling could be interiorized in a way where you really felt the person behind the storytelling, the visual storytelling. That to me was crazy because it was very different from me reading very traditional hero comic books. In those traditional comic books, you always feel the character, which to its own credit, that's something really amazing that uh, comic book writers and artists can flesh out these characters so much that you really feel like this character is alive. That's super wonderful. But at that point, I remember becoming more conscious about Neil Gaiman and Sandman, Frank Miller and Sin City, 
or Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow in Hard Boiled. Amazing, amazing stories that felt so real. They were fantastical stories, but they felt so, so real that I was like, wow, this is something that I never conceived because at that point, I was just drawing comic book characters. I, I really loved these characters that were larger than life. They did not have to answer to the rules of nature. You know, they had powers that were outside the norms that ruled all of us humans. And to me, that was amazing. That was enough for me. I never thought about what it implied to be outside of nature. I was just happy to draw somebody with like superhuman strength or like an anthropomorphic being. That was it for me. I was totally fine with that. So like I said, it was pretty amazing when I realized that there were human beings. There were actually very talented human beings underneath all these word balloons and, and vignettes and panels trying to tell stories that could connect, not in ways that they would show me that they were supernatural, that these were forces that were not abiding by the uh, rules of nature, but instead they were grounded. They were were born from the very sensible, emotional knowledge and experience that we human beings have about our own nature. And that blew me away. And I know I'm saying something that's pretty obvious by now, but when I was a teenager, that wasn't the case. So with George Pratt and Enemy Ace, it was gorgeous storytelling, gorgeous art. I mean, George is an incredible artist. And I remember one panel in particular. I have to talk to George about this because I have a feeling that he drew that panel or he drew this image that he eventually used as a panel before he knew that it was going to be part of the story. And I have a feeling that that's true, but I have to, I have to ask George. I'll let you guys know what he says. Uh, but anyways... I still remember this panel is one of the most iconic panel in this whole graphic novel where old Von Hammer is, you know, lying in bed and he's reminiscing about the days of the war and he's looking up at the ceiling, almost like puppeteering into existence this dogfight between these two planes. And it's amazing. I mean... There's something so weird and eerie about that image. It almost feels like a kid in their cradle where they're trying to grab this mobile that's above them. There's something so, so wonderful about that image that I've always had it in my brain. And I think a lot of people that read comic books and specifically that are familiar with this graphic novel, I'm pretty sure that they know that image perfectly. So I've always loved that image. I, I remember that some of the fingers are elongated. There's like this beautiful distortion. It obviously has some Dave McKean Arkham Asylum vibe to it. Some Bill Sienkiewicz in there. Just this whole tradition of wonderful artists, wonderful storytellers. A lot of that influence, a lot of that energy, this beautiful tradition is just embedded in that image. So why am I talking about this image so much? One, because I think it's absolutely wonderful. And if you guys are into graphic novels and are not familiar with this one, this is a super quick read. It's a beautiful story. It's wonderfully told, gorgeously illustrated by George. I would totally recommend it. But the thing is, I went to visit my mom the other day and I just sat on the foot of the bed while she was talking to me. And I am my mother's son, while my father is very much so present in some of the things that I am, mostly this willingness to think outside the box, although my father was more ingenious than I'll ever be. But, you know, that willingness to try things out, to only believe things when they happen to you, that's very much so my father. But everything else that I am, I think it's my mother. Everything else, absolutely everything else. So my sensibility, I think, is from my mother. The way I open myself up to strangers, that's totally my mother. And the way she communicates, my mother gesticulates so, so much. I mean, she uses her hands to talk constantly. And I think we're both the same way. Like, if we had to sit on our hands and we had to talk with somebody, we just couldn't talk. It's impossible. Right now, I'm doing this voiceover. My hands are flapping all over the place. I can't not do it. It's impossible for me not to do it. So while I was visiting her and talking to her, she started to tell whatever story. My mother can go into eight different tangents in three seconds. That's my mom. And in her brain... She feels like she's connecting stuff, but not really. If you have a conversation with her, it's the most abstract experience that you'll ever have. I tried to prepare Danny when she met my mom, and I told her, you know, she's going to start talking about things that she thinks you know about, and then she'll keep going, and she'll assume that you know these things. So don't question it. Just keep going. Keep going, because eventually she'll take the off-ramp, and then she'll land somewhere else, and you'll realize that it just serves no purpose to go back and to ask who that person was that she was referring to like five minutes ago. So that's my mother. 
maybe the structure of these voiceovers, this is me casting a stone saying that my mother goes off in tangents. Yeah, maybe the structure of these voiceovers is also affected genetically by my mother. So I apologize for that. But anyways, I was talking with my mom. Her hands are all over the place. And I was like, this is a moment that I have to paint. And my mother doesn't care. If she sees me take out my cell phone, in her mind, she's like, okay, he's going to probably draw me or paint me. But she's totally fine. Mind you, she's an artist. So she's completely, completely fine with this. It's not like she's going to pose. She's not going to try to force anything. No, no, no. She understands like this is our thing. So she's completely cool with that. So I just started like snapping photos like a madman, not even looking at my phone, not even thinking about, you know, oh, this could be a painting. I was just like, oh, this is such a cool conversation that, that I would love to have something visually to remind me of this moment of my mother. And when I got home, I looked at the photos and it's so funny because they're not great photos. Honestly, these are not amazing well-lit photos that you take because you know that you're going to paint from photographs. This is not a setup where you control this beautiful lighting, you take this really nice photo, and then you just paint from that. Information just kind of begging to be painted. But there's this weird thing that happens to me, or, or it's happened to me, I think, recently. And when I say recently, it's probably the last two or three years, where I love to paint from photos where if you would look at them objectively, you would say like, oh, no way this can be a painting. I love that. I love that there's certain things that I look at and then I can say, oh, I can speak about this through painting. I can reminisce about this through this act of painting. And it doesn't just become this act of copying this photograph and then hoping that you could tap into all the information that this photograph would hold. No, many times I'll look at a photo and there's barely enough there to make a painting, but it doesn't matter because I don't see them as the end goal. I don't think I've seen photos as the end goal for over 10, 15 years now. I just see them as the beginning. You know, they are just there to nudge me along the way. They're just there to say, hey, we are the starting point. And then whatever happens is going to happen in your painting. And I love that. That's why I feel I sometimes get into a debate with people about showing photo reference or not showing photo reference. And the thing is, to me, is something that it is important, but it's not really my objective. Like, this is not where my painting is going to necessarily go. This is only there to say, hey, you can use the information that's here if you want to. You can use some information. You can distort other information. You can edit other information. You can reorganize information. And I love that about working from photos. I very, very rarely see them as something that I can say, okay, this is everything I need. Everything I want to paint is right here. No, and I think that that's exactly what happened with the photos I took of my mom, where this series of photos are there to just remind me of this conversation that I had. There's just this really nice kind of visual cue of a conversation that I had. That's about it. So the coolest thing was that I was able to put together, to Frankenstein together, this composite of this moment, which still very much so feels like my mother, which still very much so feels like you're caught in this moment of this conversation. You just entered this room mid-conversation which feels like every single conversation that, that you could have with my mother. My mother, whenever I call her, you never get like, oh, hey, how you doing? How are you? How's your day? No, no, no. She starts a conversation where you're like, what the hell happened? Did she pick up the phone two minutes before I did? What, what is going on? But that's every single conversation with my mother. So I love that the painting has that vibe, has that energy. And in my personal visual history, I also love the fact that it's so reminiscent of George's painting of Von Hammer because they kind of have that same vibe, that same energy. I mean, obviously completely different stories, but there's an energy to them that's very much so there. And you guys know me. I was so happy to connect those things, to find those coincidences while I was working because you can't do it starting from the graphic novel panel. You know, it's not like I'm going to my mother's. And I'm like saying, Mom, I remember this panel from years ago where this old German soldier was reminiscing about a dogfight, you know, during World War One, And he had his arms up in the air and he was looking at the ceiling. Do you mind if you could recreate this image? Oh, and also, how are you feeling about your hip replacement? No, come on. Like, th that's not the way things go. Like I said, this was something that happens uh, a posteriori. This is after the fact. And it is so cool to realize that there's this visual encyclopedia that I have in my head that I would argue has 
very much so shaped my perception. So I'm probably keen to be sensible to these moments in nature because of those images that I've collected in my brain. But also I think that, you know, sometimes they're just there dormant and they just wake up whenever they find an echo in my own personal nature, in my own life. And I think that that's what happened here. So I thought it was really exciting. I thought it was really, really nice. And I think that the looseness, the fact that it's a very compressed palette in terms of value and hue, they all add up in the effort of trying to reconstruct this idea of this conversation. Again, this conversation that's going a million miles an hour in my mom's brain while I'm there, you know, light years behind just trying to catch up. I really, really like this painting. I think this is a very faithful, very honest painting about how my mother communicates and it just feels like her. I know this is weird. It almost seems like I'm trying to sell you guys the idea that it does feel like her, but that is her. And there's no other better way than I can explain it. So I was very nice today. Very, very nice. So that's going to be it for today. Uh, join us tomorrow where we finish off this week. I think because I went to talk to my mother, there's going to be mother undertones to the painting that I do tomorrow. And I think that's totally fine. She's obviously been in my mind for the uh, last couple of weeks. So I think there's going to be perhaps not a representation of my mother, but a painting that tells a story about my mother. I think we're going to do that tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Again, thank you guys for hanging out. Bye.